Hey everybody, my name is Steve Jordans. I'm a professor of psychology from the University of Toronto Scarborough. How about we start with explaining your area of research that you, your work focuses on and how it relates to better understanding the negative implications of a disconnected world or the positive impact of building stronger social connections. Yeah, so I mean, it's funny, a lot of my work in this area resulted in a sense more from my teaching than from my research. A lot of my research focuses on educational technologies and, and how to create skills like critical thought, creative thought. But I also always teach all sorts of areas in, of psychology. And at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I could just feel how anxious we all were. Everybody was was really anxious. And one of my favorite lectures that I give to students, I call the psychology of cool. Um, and really it's just explaining to them what anxiety is, how it comes about and giving them some tips about how to manage this, what is really just a basic biological reaction to threat. Uh, and so at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I realized that the sort of content of that lot lecture suddenly had relevance to a lot of people. And so I created a short course online on a, on a platform called Coursera.org. It's a free online course. Uh, and it was just to help people understand and manage uh, the anxiety that came with COVID-19. Um, that kind of got some attention to me as a mental health kind of guy. And I ended up on, on radio shows. And one of the things that they would often ask is, well, what can people do? What are the basic steps? And, and I have a few foundational things that include, of course, sleeping well, eating well, exercising, those sorts of things. But then I always said the next go to the next insulator from anxiety is social connection. And, and that's just based on all of the literature that that overwhelmingly shows the more close connections you have, I shouldn't say the more, but but as long as you have three or four or five good close social connections, you seem to be very insulated from a lot of the stress and anxiety reactions that other people are subject to when they have fewer connections. So it just seems like a really powerful variable. And so I was out spreading the word, especially because of the concept of social distancing. So I was saying, no, not social distancing, physical distancing, but socially we want to be snuggling, <laughs> social <laughs> snuggling. We want to reinforce those connections because they're going to keep us sane through all of that. Uh, I, I had some other tips as well, but that was, you know, that is probably the most powerful variable according to the science behind it all. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of that, uh, what kind of impact do you think that the physical distancing, masking, lockdowns during COVID had on a broader population? Yeah, I mean, you, the, the brain can't help but respond to sort of fear. Um, it, we've got whole systems in our brain that are there to keep us alive, um, but they orient our attention um, towards anything fearful and they alter our behavior to try to protect us. And so when we're being told that other humans are dangerous and being close to them is dangerous, um, you know, our brain cannot help but kind of hear that, listen to that and react in, a, in its more emotional level. And that makes us at some level a little more fearful of other individuals than we were, which maybe doesn't sound that bad, except so many people, especially younger people, um, were really already at a level of social anxiety. They're already having trouble making friends and knowing how to talk to strangers and doing these kinds of things. And when you now add that little level of you know physiological fear, um, I think it's really made things worse. And, and we've done some research uh, recently that suggests it is uh, levels of social anxiety are really, really high. And I think the pandemic has contributed that and bumped it up a little bit more. And now I know you mentioned young people, but do you think there are any other groups that have uh, been hit especially hard by this? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, it hit hard differently in different ways. So, so, you know, we can think of the elderly who many of whom were extremely isolated and in fact died alone, which is just horrible for them and their families. Um, we think of people with uh, say autoimmune deficiencies or something. I have a good friend and colleague who basically has not left his home for three years because he had a, a kidney transplant, I think, uh, prior to the pandemic, and he's on immunosuppressants and he is basically will not leave the house. And so, you know, that sort of impact is, is one kind of impact. Um, but there is another impact and, I, and I'll still kind of sneak back to the young a little bit because when we're in that age where we're about to leave home or thinking about leaving home, but we don't yet have our own family of our own. So that little period, which we could say is, you know, roughly, I don't know, between 17 and mid twenties or something like that. That's a period. And even before that, when 
the priority of humans is to build out a social network to meet other people. And we all think of ourselves as teenagers. That's what we did, right? We had went to events, we tried to meet new people, we tried to build out our social network. And for that whole group to suddenly be denied that at that time of their life um, is extremely difficult. That's that's a formative stage for forming these social connections. And, and we've already said, you know, we've kind of talked about two counteracting forces here. Social connection can keep you sane, but social anxiety keeps you away from those social connections. It makes it hard to get those social connections. So it's almost like there's a cure, but it's out of reach for a lot of people until they can kind of get through that. And so I think young people and, and you know, those who are now in their late teens and early 20s, they in some ways in the psychological sense got hit the hardest by all of this. What role do you think the Genwell Project, which is Canada's human connection movement, can have in rebuilding a connected Canada where everyone has a sense of connection and belonging? Yeah, uh, such an such an important role. And for kind of a weird reason, we kind of have two brains inside of our brains. We have our very old limbic system where emotion and instinct and habit kind of reign. And then we have our frontal lobes where rational thought and strategic kind of thinking happens. We tend to think of ourselves in terms of our frontal lobes. And that's who we think we are. We think of the goals we're striving for, all this. And we very often underappreciate the important role our, our emotional brain plays. And so a lot of people, that's where social connection happens. Social connection happens because we feel safe around another individual. We trust them. We feel like we can say anything and they won't judge us or they won't, you know, view us negatively. And that safety is really huge, but it's a really at an emotional level and at an intellectual level, we sometimes don't really understand how important it is. And so the Genwell project and, and you know, I have to do a shout out to Pete Bombacci specifically because um, of his tireless work with Genwell. Um, his, his goal is to make people aware that there is a solution. It's within reach. It's maybe not as tough as we all might think it is. Um, if we just appreciate its value and see it, um, then, you know, that's a critical first step. But of course, it's also, he goes beyond that first step too. He, he would use the words, let's see if I get these right, educate, empower, and catalyze is, is, is his favorite. So education is the first step, make people aware of that and then empower them, give them opportunities to actually form that social connection and continue to work with them to sort of catalyze this into more of a habit instead of something people are doing intentionally. Uh, and so it's really, you know, that's what people need to change their behavior. It's not enough to just know I should be doing this you need to really make it easy for me to get the practice and and that's what Genwell is doing as well uh, it's a tough battle because people don't appreciate the importance but um you know get pete to come do a presentation somewhere and and he will show you a case that's so overwhelmingly strong um you will just know that okay this is the path to go now how do i go on that path <laughs> so what are the, some of the things that you do to maintain strong social connections yeah, I mean, the, I mean, part of it is often through our hobbies and things like that. So, so I'm in a band, and, and some of my social connection is just, you know, those are two of my closest. So we talk about having some really close social beings. You know, those two, two guys. I shouldn't say two guys in the band. The three of us, in the the three in the band. One of them's my wife, so she's my strongest social connection. But the other two, um, you know, I know I could reach out to them if I if I need anything. And and so sometimes it's through our hobbies. We also ride motorcycles, and we have friends that we know through motorcycle riding. Uh, but every now and then, there's also that willingness to embrace the uncomfortable. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you one example. I was recently invited to this conference I'd never heard about. Um, and it was all about just coming and meeting a bunch of people who had all been successful in their lives. And I went there and I knew nobody. And I feel like everybody feels walking into that, like, oh my goodness, I have to try to say hi and make conversation with all these strangers. But when I see those opportunities now, I take them and, and, and I and I kind of say, okay, it will be uncomfortable, but a lot of the best things in life start out uncomfortably. Um, and then that comfort that sort of grows from that, that's how we become friends with people. We start as strangers and we feel that comfort and trust uh, and they become our connections through life. So more than ever, we used to be able to just rely on random interactions to, to kind of put us in front of people we hadn't seen for a while or whatnot. But with um, more of us spending more time at home, hybrid work, all these kinds of things, I think more and more we have to intentionally 
try to do something, you know, make, make a night of, a, of, of the week, even when we hang out with family, let's have a karaoke night with family, but make sure that we spend that time doing something together fun. Um, I, I think we need to be a little bit more intentional about forming these social connections and, and view it not just for ourselves but also for that person we're connecting with. Two people always benefit from every social connection. And so, you know, even if you're not hungry for it yourself right now, you know, some maybe think and say, do you know somebody that is? And, and would you be willing to spend a half an hour on the phone chatting with them about, about something, knowing that it would make, maybe make a big difference to them? Uh, if, if you care about that person, that's a great thing to do. You already kind of answered with the next question, but just some go-to tips that Canadians can use to build stronger social connections for themselves or for someone else. I mean, there's, there, I could almost give you two or three, but there's one I really, really want to highlight because so many people avoid social interaction because of something called the fear of negative evaluation. Um, and there's like a questionnaire we can give you for to, to see how strong this is in people. And it just goes with social anxiety like this. And, and so basically the story is we're worried about talking to somebody because we think they won't like us um, in the end. There is one secret that hasn't been a secret. In fact, it's the basis of a lot of psychological theories now, and it's called active listening. Um, if you ever listen to two people having a conversation, you will realize that most humans do what we call me too conversations, where I tell you about my weekend and you say, oh yeah, and then you tell me about your weekend. And so it's sort of about me and then it's about you and then it's about me and it's about you. Um, so seldom do we really take the time to let somebody else tell us something and we just want to listen uh, and so there's an art to this and it's called active listening people can look at it online it is the basic basis of humanistic therapy let the other person work out their issues you're not there to solve their problems you're there to let them explore their problems uh, and one of the ways i explain this to people in the easy sense is think of a reporter on tv interviewing somebody is it about that reporter do you learn anything about that reporter you know, hopefully not, not much. Usually the reporter is just trying to pull information and a story out of the other person. If you try that with somebody else, you'll notice something uh, very quickly. First of all, it's easy. You just have to ask questions um, and just sort of follow up on the next thing. Oh, where do you work? Oh, what do you do at that place? Can you tell me a little bit more about what that's about? And you can have some of these questions sort of in your back pocket. But the other thing you'll notice early on is if you do this authentically, if you are really asking questions that you want to know the answers to, the person will like you. They, we all love people who A, listen to us, because so few people do, and B, are actually interested in what we have to say. And so really, if you want to succeed at a social interaction, you just got to kick it off with some questions, listen intently, follow up on those questions, uh, and, and the person will already like you. And, and then what I usually say from there is, along that path, look for what I call connection points. Um, maybe that person mentions motorcycle and it's me. Um, and so now at some point I can come back to that and I can say, okay, that's, uh, that's a point of connection between the two of us. And once we find one of those, we have all this material to talk about, you know, what kind of bike do you ride? Where have you been? Blah, blah, blah. It suddenly opens up things. And so when you find those connection points, that's what you can jump to. And then it can be a little bit more of that me too. You know, I'm not suggesting you have to listen the whole time, um, but that's a great technique for a safe way to interact with another human being um, such that they will actually like you um, and from, yeah, just from behaving that way.